Right, good morning. So my name's uh, Alex Berry. I'm the founder of Sutra and I do the design work on the uh, suturing devices that we're going to show you. Um, uh, and I'm uh, Richard Trimmett. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon from the Brompton Hospital. I've been working with Alex on several devices uh, that can help some of my patients. We have half an hour, so what we're going to do is talk about the past, present and future of the work that we're doing. There is one slide I'll give you a little bit of a warning to. It's We've converted it into black and white and it's nine seconds, but it is uh, a slide of something in surgery. So if you're very, very squeamish, in black and white you really can't tell. Uh, but apart from that, uh, most of them are going to just be simple slides. So as a brief history, Sutru, we've designed a device that does uh, stitches, suturing, automatically. Uh, we have several different sizes of uh, the device, and it's based on a, a core component in the device being able to be applied to different sizes and different types of needles. Uh, nearly all of the parts apart from one are uh, 3D printed, additive manufactured in uh, a combination of SLM, SLS, SLA, the, the whole gamut. Um, and we've been able to now come down to sizes as small as a penny. So the, the head you can see there is as small as a penny with 45 components inside and fully functioning um, device that has uh, consistency and force while reducing the cost of development by a factor of about 60. So when we first uh, came up, up with this, uh, now about 10 years ago, um, we didn't know anything about additive manufacturing. So the first prototype that we did, which didn't have any chance of functioning, was milled. So this is precision milled, um, and it took six months to get this. Uh, it cost 1,500 pounds and didn't work. Uh, didn't have a chance of working. Um, and the comparison that we have now in the, uh, the techniques that we use, of course, this could be manufactured in, in less than a week for a few pounds. This is now our core uh, size uh, benchmark device. This is uh, what we have uh, for most of our testing. And the example we have with this uh, is that in comparison to doing suturing by hand, the forces that we can generate behind the needle with this device are approximately twice as much. So uh, for studies that have shown how much you need to be able to turn a needle to put it through uh, tough soft tissue, this device now can power it by the press of a button uh, with twice as much force, all using additive manufacturing techniques for all of the components. Okay, so uh, this is uh, me in my office. So we run a very large um, robotics uh, cardiothoracic service in the UK. In fact, we run the largest. We've done about 700 operations. And um, I've included this video to, to show you one of the issues that we have. Stitching when the chest is open or in any other part of the body is relatively straightforward when you have easy access. But the limitations of the robotic instruments, as you can see, are the, the stripey instruments. Uh, trying to pass a needle through a tissue uh, capturing the needle and then repositioning, it, it's a big challenge. So you can really look at an automatic suturing device as, uh, as helping both ends. So at the, at the basic end, if you want to close the wound quickly and safely by someone who's inexperienced and you want to avoid the risk of sticking themselves with a needle and you want it done quickly and reproducibly, then you can use a big device and it has all sorts of applications in general surgery where there are large wounds or even veterinarian surgery or even out in the battlefield. The other high end is for robotics, where we just cannot get uh, the dexterity of the instruments without force feedback to the point where we can suture in anything like the speed that we can do in the open procedure. So my challenge to Alex was, now that we had the tools, could we make this small enough to adapt it to the robotic equipment so that we could do the stitching as neatly as you've seen the machine do and improve upon this? And this is what he's come up with. So this is, a, this is a standard surgical trocar. So this is what we put, uh, we put either through the chest or the abdomen or any body cavity. It means that we can introduce uh, instruments in and out without causing trauma. Uh, in order so that it'll pass through the port, uh, it's designed to be straight. And then Alex has made it so that the end of the instrument can then rotate into its working position. And because it can angulate, it means that we can uh, suture in any angle we want. So with a combination of rotation uh, and the angulation, we can basically get the needle in any of the positions we want. 
and we can rotate it either forward or backwards. So the whole idea would be instead of having to pass a needle, um, take the robotic instrument out to insert a needle, put the arm in, and then as you saw in the video stitch, the idea is that the needle is preloaded in this, this forms part of the robotic arm, and as you can see in the prototype, the needle will pass through nice and smoothly uh, with a guide that allows the, um, the suture to follow behind. Um, and it now works. It can it now does. be done. <laughs> it worked for the first time three days ago. So uh, this slide in particular is this instrument uh, stripped down. Uh, the components that are in there that you can see, those gears, are module 0.2 gears. So the length of the teeth of those gears is 0.4 millimeters. Uh, these have been SLM printed uh, on a concept laser M-Lab machine. And the quality of the parts is high enough where there is no uh, post-print cleaning. So that goes, uh, those components go into uh, the head, we call it here, uh, with another series of gears you'll see in a second, and start turning immediately. Uh, the level of precision uh, of those components is high enough where there's no post-production. So this is a plate, uh, a print plate, a 90 by 90 print plate uh, from a concept that they uh, produce for us. And on this plate are 600 components. Uh, now, they're not 600 different components because we didn't need that. Um, but effectively, you could. So you could have 600 completely separately manufactured and designed components at a single cost, which is really the big difference in the, uh, the process that we've been able to use now for prototyping. We do sets of uh, uh, 10. So out of the 600 parts, we can have uh, 60 different variants of uh, the components we want to test at the same cost. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we, uh, I think we had four sets. So uh, it did mean that we could then take uh, a, a range of components and uh, test them in different environments and on different uh, uh, heads that we uh, have here. Uh, this is just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, one of the problems that we had with people uh, trying to see these components is there was a lot of squinting. Uh, so we ended up uh, printing at eight scale uh, so that people would be able to see what's going on. And these are two of the components, obviously, were the ones in front. Now, to give you a sense of proportion, the bottom part, you can see the shaft going through the top. That is a one millimeter shaft. And it is uh, crenulated so that the roller, the top part, sleeves on but can't rotate. One of the problems that we had previously with components was that if you have a smooth shaft with a, 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 a hole on the roller that fits onto the shaft, the surface area to bond the two together is so small uh, that they were just breaking between the two very, very quickly. So the idea that now you can print components consistently with an effect where you, uh, you attach one to the other and it can't rotate was really a very big step for us and it allowed us to be able to miniaturize the components that go into here with the confidence that it would then function in rotating a needle. This again is a sense of scale uh, and that previous component that you saw is um, uh, underneath the penny. Yes, there we go, just to the right. Um, so again, you know, in comparison to a penny, the point being with this particular image is that we took the roller from a different print and uh, we're able to fit it onto one of these components, again, without any cleaning. So it's a consistency in, the, in additive manufacturing now to certain scales that it allows quite a sea change in, uh, in prototyping to these scales. Just an example of when you do get 600 parts, you then have to find somewhere to put them. So I am a great collector of pots. I have a lot of pots with tiny little parts in. I um, uh, go onto eBay on a regular basis and have lots of collections of little pots because um, you can make so many different uh, components that um, you start getting confused very easily. And then finally, this is uh, one of the prints that, uh, again, we have with Concept, where on this print alone are all of the components uh, necessary for uh, a full set of uh, one of these prototypes. So whereas beforehand you'd, uh, you'd be getting components from different sources and having to combine them, one pl uh, print on one plate, you take them all off the plate, very little post-cleaning, stick it all together, put a needle in, and pray. Okay, so we've okay. done that, it works. Um, and we'll test it in the skills lab, probably later on this week, maybe next week, take some videos and show that we can do this. So, 
as we now had a process for making stuff quickly uh, that could help with surgery, I asked Alex if there were, uh, if he would mind taking on some other challenges. Um, so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what I've asked Alex to work on at the moment and what's been made <coughs> here today. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time at the end throwing down a challenge with some of the things that would really help people. So you saw in the video of me stitching with the robot that we're, we're doing a beating heart operation. So the heart is still currently in use by the body, but we need to hold the small area that we're working on still. And when the chest open, we can put a big suction device in. But when we're doing keyhole surgery, we need very, very small parts that we can pass in and out. And what we don't want to do is disadvantage the patient by offering them a uh, inferior stability of the heart so that the quality of the operation isn't as good when you do it as a keyhole. So uh, this is an open uh, heart device. It's quite big. Uh, it allows us to hold the heart steady and, uh, and move on. So I said to Alex, uh, could you make me something that comes apart in pieces using the technology that we've done and that I could pass through a very small incision, use to hold the heart stable, and we could make it, throw it away, and we could even customize it to the different uh, shapes and sizes. So this is what you did, yeah? This is what uh, engineering gave me as the first drawing, the only drawing. And so then we made a prototype. Uh, and another prototype? Can you so one of the things that we did differently is that, uh, and we learned this from the suturing devices, uh, uh, we were using a conventional pathway to, um, uh, to design and develop stuff. So we come up with our best guess at what the working solution is going to be, prototype it up, um, make it, and then test it. But the one thing that occurred to us towards the end of the suturing device was we can make all our different designs simultaneously and test them and cut down. So instead of making it a serial process, we make it a parallel process. Uh, and we refer to this as sort of multi-typing instead of prototyping. And this really substantially cut down uh, the time. So what I would do is we would talk about different designs. Alex would go away and make them, and then we'd bring them all back to the skills lab and test them on the heart model to see which uh, worked the best and maybe take the best one or two and then branch those out like branches of a tree and make those in parallel. Um, and this is what you've come up with. From this, so in, yes, from so this is the final design. The previous one was the one with the internal channels. So, so one of the key things is to get suction included in this, but I had an additional problem, which is that if I make a piece of surgical equipment with channels in it, it has to go off and be certified um, in a different way to something that doesn't have channels. So it just occurred to us that if we split this into two pieces with the channels just as grooves, then we don't have to... Uh, it, it doesn't have any channels, and so the process is much simpler, and also making it and sterilizing it is also safer. So I wanted it small, I wanted it dismantleable, and I wanted it uh, not only biocompatible, but some way that it didn't have channels in. So this is the one-piece one with the channels in it. And then you also wanted to be able to shape it to a patient's heart if possible. Yes, I also want everyone custom made. So I have the CT scan or the MRI scan of the heart and I, I say, it's this radius in this plane, this radius in that plane, please make me three for tomorrow. So this <laughs> is now the, the current one. So, uh, uh, so this is what we've got. Um, and this was made here. Um, they, these two parts at the moment are now currently on two printers being made now. Uh, one at Concept Laser and one at TriTech. Uh, so those components that are all in biocompatible materials, uh, two-piece components, one is disposable and one is, uh, the underside one is disposable, the top one is uh, reusable. So there's a bigger version so that you can see what we've got. So the idea is that this piece is reusable, this, which will be biocompatible, fits in. So uh, once they're sterilized, the theatre team can just clip it into place and then it mounts on the rod, which comes in through the endoscopic port. And it looks like that. And this is the actual piece that um, we will certainly use the rod, and we may even get to use the foot plate um, next week if we can get it through CE marking and the clinical practice committee. So it'll be printed this week and used next week on, on a patient. In layman's terms, just so you understand, this goes onto a beating heart, keeps a tinier bit of it still, and Richard operates in that gap. So there's a skill to what they do with it as well, obviously. But if it's still, it's much easier to do. That's the whole deal. So we pass, so the rod comes, the rod separates from the footplate so that this can go through a small incision in the chest onto the heart. This can go through a keyhole port, similar to what you saw previously. The two can be joined together inside, help me do the operation at the end, come apart, and the disposal bit's thrown away. So the first designs we did uh, for this, we're going in the right direction, but 
I was having a problem trying to work out the final way of being able to clip it together. And this is part of the sort of TCT story is uh, meeting people here and uh, collaborating. I ended up giving up on this and handing the design over to Minima, these guys here, who were able to finalize how the two clip together. I just, I was having, my brain wouldn't function to be able to do it and was quite busy with the suturing device. So effectively, between the nearly prototypes and handing over the design, um, from finalizing the design to hopefully having it on a patient's heart, is going to be less than three months. So for a medical device prototype, that design, handing it to Minima for design, and it being on a patient's heart in less than three months, I think it's quite incredible, and it's part of the whole point of TCT. And that includes CE marking and clinical practice committee approval. So we haven't cut any corners of regulation. It will go through all the channels, but it just means that all of a sudden, if I need something, there's now a way I can see to do that. So uh, I want to move on to the, the, the yeah. I want to move on to the bit that's my domain. <laughs> so these so th this was <laughs> the, the previous images were just to show that what we can also do when yeah. we're using uh, we have a form labs machine, so we can two scale. Uh, the design just to, to verify that everything clicks together and everything goes well uh, before then going to uh, the companies where the, the components are a little bit more expensive and it takes a little bit more time. So there's a verification process that can happen. We have a form labs that I think three or four hours to print something like this. Um, so it's such a rapid way of being around? able to prototype it. Yeah, sure. Does anyone want to? You can <laughs> pull it apart. The we problem can, with uh, inviting breaks, Alex, we can make more. the problem with inviting Alex to my institution is that other people see the tools because they're in theatre and say, "Oh wow, how that's made! Can you make something for me?" So our perfusion department have got Alex on the side doing stuff as well. Um, yep. and, uh, it, it is just a, such a natural thing that uh, it's possible to turn things around so quickly. I think people but are. That, uh, that's part of the story. Is that this is sure. three odd pounds of uh, components for a department at Richards Hospital that. Any other way, the previous components that they had from this were machined and took a week in the engineering department. The way I refer to this is um, adapting the design took me half a pizza. It took half a pizza <laughs> of eating to get those components ready. Two or three pounds worth of, uh, of uh, I'm material. Not, I'm not going to talk about this because no. I want to get into this. Okay, so I'm not going to take you into my domain, okay? So um, over half a million people every year in the UK die, okay? and a lot die from cancer, but a third from circulatory diseases, and the biggest other group are respiratory diseases. So half these people are going to die because they've got a bad heart and bad lungs. Okay? It's a really, really bad problem. Every year we have 60,000 people have a cardiac arrest outside hospital. The ambulance gets to 30 and starts CPR, but unfortunately only 12,000 people walk away from that. So we have lots and lots of people dying from heart and lung disease. So what, what I want to do is try and give some relevance to it and say, if you want translational um, benefits, if you want to have something that you can take that will translate to help people, um, look at this. This is, a, this is an old paper now, but it's very important. This is New England Journal of Medicine, so one of the big journals in medicine, and it's the rematch study. And what they said is, if you've got a failing heart, um, and there are 850,000 people in the UK with heart failure, so these people, they're on home oxygen, they have to have their bed downstairs because they can't walk up the stairs, they can't drive their car, they can't work, uh, they don't feel part of society, they can't play with their grandchildren, all because they have a hydrostatic problem, a hydraulic problem, the heart just isn't pumping enough blood around the body. And I think we can help. And, and if you ever wanted any proof that these people need help, this study only had 100 people in it. If you look at the people, uh, so one group had a mechanical bump, they had their heart taken out, and replaced with a mechanical pump, or they had a mechanical pump put in as well to help them. And because all that's wrong with them is heart failure, when you put a pump in the pump's blood, all of a sudden, their problems go away. So you'll see here in the New York Heart Association class, and this is a scale we use for how sick people are, in the people with the ELVA, the left ventricular assist device, you can see that they were all suddenly transformed from group four into group two, which meant all of a sudden, they could work, drive their car, they could go swimming, they could play with their grandkids, go up and down the stairs. It made a huge difference. In the medical therapy group, they were still stuck in group four. The best tablet treatment we have in the world couldn't improve them enough to get them out of the bottom group, number four. Oh, I want to go back. The problem was the pumps let them down. So in, in, in the LVAD group, we saw um, infection, failure of the pump, 
um, clotting, bleeding. The, the devices are just not good enough to do the job. When they work, they transform the lives of the people, but the technology is not good enough. And one of the problems that we've had is that we've tried conventional engineering. These are four of the myriad of artificial hearts that are available, some of which we've put in. I don't currently implant any of these at the moment, but these are examples. And you can see what's happened is you've got a hydraulic engineer who said, it's a pump, it's about this big, I need it to pump five liters a minute. Great, I've got one off the shelf, I'll make it work. And they don't, they, 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 they don't help us. So we need to start thinking outside the box. So there are some other things around that we've played with. I've used this one, I've used this one, I've used this one. And this one is a 3D printed version. So this has got a tiny turbine inside it. it you have it put inside you and it sucks blood from here and it spits it to there. So it, it, it's a, a tiny pump. This one sticks on the outside of the heart with a levitating magnet. And this one you put it inside the heart and it pumps outside. I think we can do better than this. I think none of these have still transformed um, the lives of patients. They're, they're conventional pumps in ways that don't really apply to the body, aren't they? They are. This, and this is one of the things with, uh, with additive manufacturing now, with the, the, the level of accuracy of the components that we can get. Uh, I was saying yesterday, I think there is a possibility that given this room and that room, you could redesign one of those heart pumps and have it printed in a day. So it let me give you an exaggeration. So, so let us set out four or five challenges. So number one, if you're going to replace something that, that's similar size and capacity to the heart, it needs to be better. If you want to think outside the box, then there's a couple of things that we can do. One of them is this. So this is blood flowing in the vessels. There is no re and you can see it's full of particles. They flow all the time, and it's quite viscous, as you probably know. There's a big pipe that runs top to bottom of the body called the aorta. It's straight and it's about the size of a broom handle. And you could put something implanted next to it. You could put something in the blood and use magnetic technology that already exists to draw the particles down that would act, use this whole pipe as, uh, uh, as, a, as a pump. Um, we thought about using, you could put small microparticles in that are ferromagnetic. They get drawn down and they pull the blood with it. You could even put device in like an ore paddle that gets drawn down, then it turns, comes back, and then it presses down. You were saying about putting it in four or five different locations as well. So. Yes, and we could even, um, we'll, we'll talk about um, going smaller, but we think outside the box. You've got a big channel of blood going down the body. The heart just can't pump it. Why didn't you devise a device that helps pump the blood down the body? Oxygenation is a huge problem. This is a young girl uh, who's dependent on home oxygen. So wherever she goes, she has to take her oxygen with her. Um, and it's, it, it, for sure, it's a miserable existence. And one of the problems is that if you have an oxygen source in the house, you have to carry the piping around with you. And so why don't we apply the technology to these people to help these people? Uh, we know that the hemoglobin, the red cells in the blood, carry the oxygen, and each one carries four molecules. But it doesn't have to be that way. Um, you know, if we can print at a scale and create synthetic devices that are able to uh, capture and, and hold blood with a much higher density, you wouldn't have to pump the blood around the body. You could help people with heart failure. So instead of pumping the blood faster around the body, you just put more of the things in that it needs. So it travels at half the speed, but it still gets the delivery of what it wants. I think if you wanted to think on a, on a smaller scale, you could say, okay, well, let's move away from having a big pump. Let's make some small devices, individual pumps, and let's put them at the key points. Let's put them at the arm, the arm, and the leg, and the leg. And what happens is then you have a central pacemaker, and when your activity, uh, when the pacemaker senses your activity, needs uh, more blood to the legs, the two pumps down here force more blood down the arteries here. If you're doing something that requires upper body strength, the arm ones do. I mean, you could even have them go into the brain if you want to do more thinking. And also, you could extend these further. You could say to the girl who's dependent on oxygen. This is a, a pump that's currently implanted in people and it's used to deliver drugs. So if you've got chronic pain, it can deliver you morphine according to an algorithm or control, or it can deliver insulin if you're a diabetic and it lives inside the body. Well, why not just go a step further and put some of these inside the body that at night, when you can be connected to a high source of oxygen, it extracts oxygen from the blood and stores it. And then during the day, it could release that into the blood instead of having to wear something. There's loads of space inside the abdomen. We could put lots of devices in that would allow us to do that. And again, you could be clever and put one of these at arms and legs, small pumps that delivered oxygen to the parts of the body that needed it. So from our point of view, oh. and in um, these, are the, these are the sort of things that I, I, I would, 
love us to be able to help people with because I think we need to move away from a conventional hydraulic pump and think about how the technology, the fact that you can make things small and intelligent can really help people and make it translational. I was just going to say that uh, a lot of the, uh, the things that Richard has mentioned, I'd originally thought were intended for you know, sort of a very micro size. So maybe we weren't quite there in additive manufacturing because you have to be uh, looking at very thin wall thicknesses and would that apply? Uh, we were talking about this the other day and it's not as small as you think. So a lot of, uh, a lot of these components are within the realms of what we're able to do now. It's just more of a case of being able to combine all of the skills that uh, the range of people that are involved in additive manufacturing can come together and there can be experts in fluid dynamics, uh, designers, engineers, material scientists. Um, what we're proving with the suturing device and with the, the, the cardiac stabilizer, particularly the cardiac stabilizer, um, the development of that, when we referred to this very easily, has cost less than a PlayStation. So to develop that foot from beginning to end has cost less than the phone that in, was in my pocket. Um, because we haven't, we haven't taken the approach of we need to set up an R&D department where we have to do all of the things that cost hundreds or, or millions to do. Richard's asked a question, we've designed it, it's going to work, let's put it together and it's printing now. So um, if you're worried about the, 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 uh, the relevance and the hype, I think medicine needs help. And I think that the conventional engineering and the big pharma are not going to transform the lives of these people. The 800 with heart failure, their average expected life expectancy is, uh, is two years. So they need a help, they need something quickly. And I think this doesn't have to happen instead of conventional manufacturing, but I think that there's a great opportunity here to do the sort of multi-typing of lots of different ways. There's lots of synthetic molecules. We have uh, all sorts of simulation skills labs with um, fluid dynamics that we can do most of the testing um, to the point where um, we can be very sure that the technology will work. So it, it, it's uh, an ask or a cry from help from the medical community. And I've just had a small flavor from the footprint and the suturing device, what can be done. And I'm saying if, if you're looking for a challenge and you really want some translational benefit, these are the sorts of things that you can help people with. Just simple tasks that require a high degree of uh, innovation and engineering.